a serious sum of money. You say you cashed on her behalf almost $5,000 in checks during the course of a month before you discovered that there was nothing to cover them. Then there was a check given to you by the defendant that was a bad check that was supposedly her boyfriend's check to cover your losses. And then there's a small sum that you have been paid back. So you say you are now out of pocket about $4,650 thanks to the defendant. You first. Well, Your Honor, it all started, um, I've known Arielle, her family, excuse me, I've known her family for about 18 years off and on. I grew up with her mother and her aunt. Um, it all started around March 31st, well actually before that, it started before that, when she came to me and she's been telling everybody as far as family wise that she had an inheritance from her grandmother and that uh, she just had to wait till she was 18 to be able to access her funds. When the time came, as far as her 18th birthday, she came to me and said, well, I got a couple fees and things that need to be paid as far as for her prom dress and she had some other bills that needed to be paid as far as her, for her family, as far as cell phones and food and other things like that, of that nature. And she also gave me the story of her being pregnant and I said, okay, well, this is unfortunate. She's 18. And I know how that situation was because I was a young mother myself. And so I listened to her story and I said, okay, well, she said, well, unfortunately, though, she wasn't able to access her own account without her grandfather's consent, without his signature, but she needed help. But she said, well, I can access it through checks. I just can't go to the actual bank and withdraw the actual cash. I said, okay, she came to me, and I said, well, let me see if I can, what I can do. I have an account, because she asked her aunt first, which is her mother's sister, to and cash checks. And aunt declined. Yes. Said she didn't have the money. And that's when I was put in a situation of, well, why don't you ask your auntie Teresa? And I said, well, okay, let me see what I can do to help you. So she came to me March 31st and presented the first check in the amount of $250. And then she presented me another one, I believe, same day, but in a different amount of $500. And asked me, again, to cash these checks for her due to the fact she has some cell phone bills. $250 and $500, same yes. day. Yes. And said, well, I need a cell phone bill paid. Um, they didn't have any food in the house, and there's quite a few children in there. So being the parent that I am, I didn't want to see the other kids going hungry. Wait a minute. What other kids going hungry? As far as her brothers, her sisters. What about your friend, girlfriend, her aunt? Well, her mother and her aunt um, didn't really have the finances to cover it because they were paying some bills. Her mother couldn't cover it. What about your friend, her aunt? She couldn't cover it either. So they all she's going to help together out in her same house. nieces and nephews. All right, because they all... How noble. Well, they all live in the same house. And another part of the story was the fact that um, her aunt was supposed to be on the account with Ariel and was the reason why, another reason she couldn't cash the checks is because her aunt was taking the money out and wasn't depositing anything back in it. Well, how does the aunt get money out of a trust fund unless she is the trustee by drafts or checks drawn on that account without the signatory authority to do so? It doesn't make sense. No, that's just the story I was given. That's the story you're given. Right. Now, you know this family for 18 years. Yes, sir. You've known her and considered her a play niece for four years. Yes, since sir. she's been 14. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Grandfather won't okay it. Mother is too broke busted. Aunt won't okay it and you decide to help her get around her adult kin and their decisions relative to grandmother's estate why should I have a problem with that concept well because I guess because in other words your son is her age 
Yes. You set something up so your close and personal friends decide to go behind your back and undo something that you set up through your will and defeat your purposes. What's wrong with that picture when the friend of the family is doing that? A lot's wrong with it when you put it on Yes, that. well, that's my problem. Why did you do it? Well, due to the fact that, again, I felt close enough to them that Honestly, I didn't How do know. you feel close enough to underparent the parental authority in the family? That's assuming that we actually have a trust. Do we have, in fact, a trust? I honestly don't know, to my knowledge. No. Well, what does it say on the checks, the instruments that you received from the defendant and purportedly deposited in your account to secure funds that you dispersed to her in cash. What does it say on those checks? Insufficient funds. No, what does the oh, check sorry. say? <laughs> they just look like regular checks, Your Honor. They don't say Let trust funds or Let me see what it says. I'm passing out all my evidence. How in the world is she supposed to just turn 18, write money on an, a, checks on an account she has personally? Where's the trust? These things just indicate she can sign it on her own. There's nothing in there that dedicates any trustee or any executor has to go and deal with this, or any guardian's got to do anything with this. It's just a personal account. Yeah, and I played the naive role on that. We'll be right back with Judge Joe Brown. So why do you write these checks to the planner? Because she, she asked me for loans. Oh, she her told, idea. She told me that she needed to get her car fixed, and she said that she wanted to get she a cell phone. She needed the money, not home. you. No. We're back with Judge Joe Brown. The plaintiff in this case says her friend's daughter needed to access some money, so she used her account to cash checks for her. She says the checks came back insufficient, causing her account to be overdrawn. Let's take a look. What have you got to say? Uh, well, Your Honor, um, all of that stuff that she just told you, all of that was false. We well, had, what we about the checks I'm looking at? What are they? That false? No, the checks are not false. Ariel D. Rawls. Yes. They are processed. How did we come to have $4,650 worth of processed checks when we give you credit for what you paid her to reimburse her? Oh, and Navy Federal Credit Union. Keep going. We were not hurting financially. My mother is an STNA. My mother is a certified yeah. STNA. My aunt, she's an STNA, and she deals with MRDD people. Oh. So we were not wor we were not having trouble financially. We didn't. So know we why never... do you write these checks to the plaintiff? Because she she asked me for loans. Oh, it was she her told, idea. She told me that she needed to get her car fixed, and she said that she wanted to get she a cell phone. She needed the money, not home. you. No. Well, is this a trust fund or are these accounts? Uh, is this the money in the account from a trust or what? It's, a, it's money in the account from a trust fund. You got 23000 from your late mm, grandmother. Yes, I did. Well, what does your grandfather have to do with this? What does he have to do with it? Uh, well, him and my grandmother set it up. So how are you supposed to get money out of the trust fund that your grandmother set up when your grandfather is the trustee or the administrator and he's not okay in it. How are you supposed to get money from the trust into your personal bank account? My grandfather transferred everything over and put it in my name and took it out of his and oh, my grandmother. he did? Yes, Why he did. did he do that? Since he'd have to get permission from the probate court to do it. So how does he manage to disperse it without the court's permission? And if he did, why do you need to go to her? Why can't you just go to your own bank with your own check, write it out, sign it, present your ID, and get your own funds out of your own bank account? She never cashed those checks for me. She came to me asking me for Oh, money. you didn't get any of it? No, I didn't. Why I didn't did you tender anything. to her this check from your boyfriend? From my boyfriend. Because she said that she said that the checks had returned back insufficient funds. Of course they did, because you couldn't have gotten any trust fund money because 
There is nothing that's deposited in your account, because if there was one, your grandfather couldn't disperse it to you without going back to court. So your boyfriend wrote a check for your benefit to give to the plaintiff. And that's a lie. To do what? To cover it up. How much was it? Cover what up? You said the magic words, cover it she up. She came to me telling me that she owed the bank $4,000, and I couldn't understand why. Like I said, the first What happened to the $4,000? What happened to it? Did you get any? No, I didn't get anything. Well, if you didn't get any, why did you present her with this check from your boyfriend to cover checks, $4,600-some-odd dollars worth with insufficient funds? <laughs> Because she said the checks had returned back. Why did you have to get your boyfriend to give you a check if this is all a misunderstanding? You got 23K. Why don't you just put it, some of that ought to cover this? I know. Clifton J. Fuller. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, may I say something? In the sum of $5,000 to make her whole. Why do you need to make her whole? with a 5k check from your boyfriend to cover what ought to have been satisfied by funds on account from the $23,000 trust fund that your grandfather dispersed to you. Your Honor, that's not even his signature. Hold on. My account was frozen. Why was it frozen? Because my, my mother was taking money out of my account. How does your mother take money out of your account? Because she's on the account. I don't see her on there. I see your name only. How about this one? She on this account? No. So what does your boyfriend do, the gentleman listed here, who tenders a $5,000 check? What does he do to be able to have that? He For her. Or did he do this without you knowing it? He didn't give her the check. Who did? I did. Well, he wrote it, didn't he? No. Who wrote it? I did. So you forged it? No, I didn't forge his signature at all. Well, who did this? I don't know, but it wasn't me. You didn't sign it? No, I didn't. So you gave her the check. Your boyfriend didn't sign it, and you gave it to her. How did you, who is this? Who did this? Who is this? And why are you lying to me? I'm not lying to you. Through your teeth. I'm not lying at all. The truth is not in you. I'm telling you the truth. We'll be back with more Judge Joe Brown in a moment. Look at this known signature. Look at all these tall letters throughout the signature. Those aren't here in the question signature, are they? So it's obvious, Judge that these signatures weren't written by the same person. We're back with Judge Joe Brown. The defendant in this case says the plaintiff needed some help with bills, so she gave her some loans. When her checks were insufficient, she gave the plaintiff a replacement check from her boyfriend. Let's take a look. Madam Salzer, come forward, please. Ms. Rena Salzer, would you please, for the record, for this matter, state what your business is? I am a forensic document examiner. Handwriting analyst, right? That's right. Would you tell us what you uh, were charged with doing in this particular matter? I was instructed to examine the question signature and compare it to the defendant's known signature. $5,000 check we've seen That's right. display. Exhibit A, please. That one. Now, did you have a sample of the defendant's handwriting? I did. So Where? here here we have the question to check, exhibit B, please. This is the questioned signature from the mm -hmm. check, and this is the known signature of the defendant's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So, in order to conclusively identify two or more specimens of handwriting as having been executed by the same person, there has to be an absence of fundamental, unexplainable differences in combination with similarities in all important details. And as you can see, these signatures are very different. There are many fundamental, unexplainable differences between them because they're constructed differently. 
Look at this known signature. Look at all these tall letters throughout the signature. Those aren't here in the question signature, are they? And the letters O, N, and E, R in the known signature are made with a wavy line. And in the question signature, those letters are distinctly formed, O, N, E, R, so that you can read them. So it's obvious, Judge, that these signatures weren't written by the same person. All right. Now, do you have any idea who wrote the signature on the instrument in question? Well, what's interesting about handwriting is that it's an ingrained habit. So it's extremely difficult for anyone to suppress their own writing habits when they're trying to copy someone else's. So that brings us to Exhibit D, please. So I compared the question signature to the defendant's known signature. And sure enough, her own writing habits appear in the question signature. Look at this. We have a circle over the I to dot it. We have a circle up there in the question signature as well. Look, we have these short, tightly looped L's in the uh, defendant's known signature. Those are also here <laughs> in the question signature. And look at how this R is formed right there. Look at this R. And the general slant is the same. And the general letter proportion is Couldn't the same between hide. the two. So, Judge Joe Brown, it's obvious that these were written by the same person. Well, in other words, it's obvious that the defendant is a person that signed the instrument in question for $5,000. You got it. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. You're welcome, Sarah. Judge. This is simply a minor twist on a scam we've had in here. See, it says Navy Federal Credit Union. What happens is when you deposit a check in a federal credit union, they give immediate credit for it, and the funds are available within 24 hours. It takes from three to six weeks for the fact that those checks are completely bogus to show up, and then they start debiting the account. You put it in, and you tender the funds over to your accomplice, and what you do is you give her the cash and see the side story that is not true is that because it's federally insured and these checks are not good, your money will be restored. No, you got the money. You just have a debit in the account. So you went along willingly with her little plot, your mutual plot, and you both between you have broken a number of federal laws, some state laws, and you could do some serious time in a federal penitentiary. Have fun, you guys, tonight. Out of here. I hope you have a good time getting prosecuted. I am doing it. In the whole thing. The defendant in this case was clearly taken aback when the judge presented her with a check from her boyfriend. She was vague or silent when asked about it. It is curious considering she said she was so secure financially. The judge believes that the plaintiff is also involved. The case is dismissed. We'll bear back. Handwriting expert shows it clearly. The defendant's behavior was even more telling. She denied signing that check but had no explanation for it. The judge says the plaintiff doesn't have clean hands either. The case is dismissed. For information on future cases or to contact this court, check out our website at judgejoebrown.com. An evil eye sparks a nasty brawl. And I didn't like the way you was looking at me. I'm like, dude, I look at you how I want to look at you. And he sucks. You say you beat him up. There is no good neighbor policy when a man is beaten up after he looks at his neighbor the wrong way. Concrete mixer Danny Blanson is suing his neighbor for medical bills. Defendant Jamal Conley is countersuing for his medical bills because the plaintiff threw first. Now it's Joe time. Mr. Blanchett, you're suing uh, Mr. Conley, who turns out to be one of your neighbors, for damages as a result of what you claim to be an assault and battery. Let's see, Mr. Connolly, you deny the allegations and you have a counterclaim and you're seeking damages against Mr. Blancet for an assault and battery. You first, sir, you have the burden. 
Uh, I was at a friend's house, fixing to have some ribs, and we was up on the balcony, uh, leaning over the balcony, having a cigarette. I look, looking down and noticed Mr. Connolly looking, stopping with a really imposed attitude and staring up at me. And I turned to my friend and said, uh, what's his problem? Oh, I've been having problems with him, too, if it's the same guy. Your friend said he'd been having problems. Yes. So what did you do, sir? Yeah, well, I just sat there waiting on the ribs, and then uh, I was waiting for Sue to come over, my fiancé, ex-wife. Long story there, but uh, she was on her way over, so I started heading down the stairs, and I figured I'd Started tell, heading down the stairs? Yeah, I went downstairs, and I was going to, I wanted to find out, some time elapsed, and then <clears> the more I thought of it, I was trying to find out what, what his problem was? He didn't well, even wait, know wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. From the point where you are on the balcony. Yes, sir. And you look down and you see the defendant looking at you with some sort of uh, look that caused you to detect hostility. Yes, sir. How long lapsed between that point and when you say you are now going down the stairs? Seven to ten minutes. All right. And at one, at which at this point he actually stopped and made that look and gesture. Uh, some time went by. I went down and asked him. You walked up to him. Walked towards him. I walked down the stairs, started heading towards him. Stuck, came up short, turned around, pointed to the back, and he looked up back and says. Uh, what the hell is your problem? I was up on this balcony and I didn't like the way you was looking at me. And when I turned back, he was right, right in my face, close enough. Well, what did he do? Well, he, he was, we were, had maintained the distance at that time when well, I looked wait, back. Wait, wait, wait. How, okay, you walked up to him and you got, you put I in your complaint yes, 14 to 18 inches away from him. No, sir. He got 14, 18. As an ex-correctional officer, I know not to approach anybody. You don't let them in your your space. Okay, and you, don't you get say in your space. complaint that he stepped forward 14 to 18, 18 inches from your face. Yes, sir. So what did you do then? Well, out of instinct, I pushed him out of my out of my space because I you felt pushed. Threatened. Yes, sir. I felt threatened. Anytime anybody gets within that space, it poses a immediate threat. So what happens uh, after you shove him? Uh. After I shoved him, he started coming towards me again, and I went to block him. Because when I got to stare at his chest, I realized he had about a four to six inch reach on me. So if I tried to do that again, he could definitely do so this. So what happened? What happened? I, well, you don't really remember because well, you say you down. recall falling sideways, uh, and then you woke up later. Yes, sir. At that point, I lost my balance. And then you woke up later. Me. When I look back, that's, that's when the lights went out. When okay, they came back on, I was on the ground. You submitted some medical uh, damages, a claim for that. Okay, you've made out a basic case. You, sir, what do you have to say in defense? Well, actually, now, uh, I sir. I think you were saying you and your wife uh, had just arrived in the complex. You lived there, right? Correct, correct. Uh, and you were unloading a vehicle. Where had you been? Oh, uh, my family, we threw a uh, fish fry for Labor Day. So I was pretty much back and forth all day because I had some neighbors. Well, actually, let me back it up. The guy that he was actually visiting, me and that neighbor had gotten into it a couple of weeks before because I saw that neighbor on my patio at 2.30 in the morning. That was about a month before that. The day of Labor Day uh, holiday, I was helping uh, these two uh, females move that live across the hall from this guy. So I was back and forth from the fish fry and coming back and helping them move from my pickup truck. So by the time, what, about 2 o'clock, 2.30, um, when we were actually getting ready to go to the fish fry, I went back over there to let them know that I was gone and they can go ahead and just keep my truck and I just gave them the keys. And that neighbor there got into it with me then. So by the time we pulled into the apartments, I get out the truck, let my boys out. They go run off with their friends. I'm coming, uh, got out the truck, just went around the corner to my front door. I was just going to go out to my patio door. And I looked to the side of me, and this guy's standing there. <laughs> and he's like, what's up? 
I'm like, what's up? It's like, uh, why are you looking at me like that? I'm like, dude, I look at you how I want to look at you. And he socks me. We'll be right back with Judge Joe Brown. He's hit. And that's I had on some sunglasses, and it cut me right here. Oh, he say you beat him up. Huh? He say you beat him up. Yeah, more than likely. The plaintiff in this case claims he shoved the defendant out of the way when he got in his face. And then the lights went out. But his injuries are clear, and the defendant needs to pay. Let's take a look. He says he pushed you because you were in his space 14 to 18 inches away. <laughs> but I don't, I don't remember the push. I, I remember he socked me first. He's hit me. And that's I had on some sunglasses, and he cut me right here. So when he socked me, you know, I socked him. Oh, he said you beat him up. Huh? He said you beat him up. Yeah, more than likely. Yeah. Because I, I, I didn't, I mean, I, I've never seen this guy ever in my life, ever. I mean, for, and it just kind of threw me off that he hit me, and like we were just standing there, and I'm like, who is this dude? You know what I'm saying? So, so my, my cousin, he's right here, standing here watching the whole thing, because he just brought the, brought the food back. He's standing there, uh, he's, uh, standing there when uh, it was going on. So... After I'm arguing with them, he's laying on the ground. I turn back around, and it's another guy pulls up with his wife and another uh, little girl or something like that. He jumps out his car and with a golf club and like, yeah, you, you want to with an old man? You want to with an old man? And I'm looking at him like, dude. And my hands cut open and bleed and what have you from, from this guy here. So when I see that guy, I'm like, dude, that's whatever. You know, but then he cowers down, you know, but I don't know what's going on because my cousins, he's like standing about right here for me in the parking lot. And I'm looking at this guy jumping out <coughs> the car. Then that's when my cousin like pulled a gun because that guy came jumping out with the with a golf club. That's the one over here. He had the pistol. Well, it just All happened right, now. So I've got quick. your damages. Now, your contention is he started it. And your contention is he started it. Right. We, was, we weren't even at the house for like five minutes. Well, I'm, I, I can do this. Every, uh, I'm going to hear from you, please, ma'am. You are the plaintiff's wife. Uh, girl, uh, fiance. Fiance. Well, you have the same last name. We I mean, married once. Okay. You divorced him at one time. Now you decided to marry him again. I divorced her. Okay. <laughs> All right. You saw what he is describing? No, actually, I was at home. I didn't see any of it. You didn't see anything? No. Okay. Well, all right. You, sir. You, uh, <laughs> you come on back up, Ms. Blancy. All right. Mr. Marshall. Yes, sir. You're Mr. Connolly's cousin. Do you have anything to offer? I mean, mm -hmm. just like he said, what happened was we pulled You in. saw what he saw. Yeah. So you shove him back to put him outside of the, your reach, your space, but you caused your space to intrude on him. I can't do anything with your complaint because you got what you brought on yourself. <laughs> now, that means you prevail on your cause complaint on the issue of liability. You're not asking for any punitive damages. You're simply asking for your medical. So you'll get $3,613 in your cost. And this courtroom is now in recess. This case gives new meaning to neighborhood watch. The stare down got physical. The plaintiff went looking for trouble and he found it. He gets nothing in the courtroom today. The defendant recovers on his counterclaim. On today's Judge Joe Brown. They were going to the chapel, going to get married. We went out for seven and a half years. We were engaged for two. Ah, uh, longer than most. Then she left him at the altar. She informs me that she's been seeing someone else for about a month. It has cold-blooded. In life, it's about being real. It's about taking care of your own business. Real cases of passion for justice. Judge Joe Brown. In the courtroom today, he says his wife-to-be turned runaway bride, and she took the engagement ring with her. Real estate broker Aaron Lossness says his ex-fiance won't return the engagement ring. Defendant Allison Lee says she took the ring because she paid for it. Now, here's Judge Joe Brown.
Let's see, you're suing the defendant for your contribution to the cost of an engagement ring. You say she called the wedding off 10 days before it was to occur and advise you that she had started seeing someone else. Is that right? That's correct. And right. how long had you been acquainted with the defendant? Uh, we went out for seven and a half years. We lived together for six. We worked together for six. We were engaged for two. Ah, uh, longer than most. Right. We get two weeks, three days, a month, you Well, know. the whole thing started over this check for $4,600 that I gave her dad for an engagement ring. The reason why I gave it to them is because her parents knew wholesale jewelers. She was very particular with the type of ring she wanted. She's a princess. She wanted the princess cut. She wanted the platinum. Everything done to her specifications. So the ring took eight months to make. Here's a copy of the check for the ring. Eight months later, her mother hands me the check, I mean the ring. Lots now that of energy, I see. Now that it's constructed, we're at a restaurant where we worked at. There's 10 people there, family and friends. I see the ring. I have probably for about two minutes. And then I get on one knee and I propose to her. And I have pictures of me proposing to her as well. <laughs> from there, from there, that was in January. Then 10 days before the wedding, just like you had said, she informs me that she's been seeing someone else for about a month and breaks it off. I have a copy of the wedding license, too. She tells me that she's been seeing this other person, and, uh, Your Honor, I did not see this coming at all. Just two hours before she told me, she went about the flower girl's dress. Not to mention, I mean, the only indication I might have seen was that two months earlier, she said we should stop having sex until the wedding day. Being an me, special. This has nothing to do oh, yes, with does. whether I owe you money oh, for yes, the ring or not. Does. I'm just trying to yes, lay the groundwork of what I'm dealing with. How does my, our sexual life have anything well, to do with yes, it whether does. I owe him money? Uh, it's Apparently, like, excuse, you know, me, I thought, excuse me, hold on. Let me give you a piece of advisement as to a thing that the court has in mind. Historically, if the bride backs out of it or the groom has good cause to back out of it, the item is returned to the groom. So now let's get into that. I heard somebody, but the groom did somebody not pay out there the got ring. caught in that situation. Now let's get back to this. I see reading this that the bride has in fact the ring, right? Right. Well, that and what you want is what you put into the ring. Right. I not a penny more. Not one penny more. It's forty-six hundred dollars. You say you put down. Right. I have that check that it I wrote from check. my mother and I's joint account. It had nothing to do with her money. That was payment for the ring. And right then, when we discussed, she told me that she was seeing this other guy. We had a joint checking account. In that joint checking account, there was roughly seventy-three hundred dollars in there. That was on a Tuesday night. The Thursday prior, I have a deposit for five thousand one hundred dollars from AAA for my car being vandalized and my stuff being sold that was mine, not hers. There's also a deposit of twenty-five hundred dollars that my father gave us as a free wedding gift, partial. So I'm not she insinuating that she waited for bank. those items to clear before she left me, but she couldn't have picked a better time to leave me, monetarily speaking. So she said that she needed most of the money because she had to get a first and last month's rent, deposit, whatnot. So out of the 7300 I didn't ask for that money. You gave me that money. She, I took 2000 you know what? and she took the rest. I wouldn't have given you two cents had it been me. I wouldn't have got it.